We have now come to a right understanding of how to fold in side information about the occurrence of an event into our probabilistic framework. Before we summarize, we should take a look at the definition again and examine it to see whether we can draw any more conclusions from it. So recall that a conditional probability of a target event A given another event B is given by a simple ratio. Colloquially, we think of this expression to represent the proportional chance of A within B. Ineluctably to the definition is folded in the idea of a joint occurrence, a conjunction of two events, that portion of A that resides inside B. Suppose we change perspective and focus on the intersection. And let us see then what comes out of this. This is an illustration of how sometimes what looks like drab mathematical manipulation can sometimes lead to surprising observations, intuition, and results. So let's begin with the definition of conditional probability and clear the denominator by multiplying left and right hand side by the probability of B. We now get an identity for the probability of an intersection of a conjunction. Now let's rewrite what we've got. Here's a good place to pick up your pencil and paper and write the equations down to make sure you internalize what we are doing. So we are clear denominators and identify the probability of an intersection of two events on the left hand side as a product of two probabilities on the right. A conditional probability of one given the other times the probability of the ancillary event. Of course, we could equally well have reversed the roles of A and B here because intersections are commutative. You could do them in any order. So we could have written the right hand side just as well as the probability of B given that A occurred times the probability that A occurred. Okay, but no matter. For our purposes, what you've now got is an expression for an intersection probability. Aha! I wonder if we can milk this and get other expressions for more complicated intersections. The next step might be to consider the intersection of three events. Well, let's consider what happens. Suppose we have events A, B and C in the probability space. I want to say something about the probability of A, intersection B, intersection C. If we group two of the events, say B and C together, well, then we have a composite event B, intersection C. If the role of B is now taken over by B, intersection C, we simply apply the definition of conditional probability and write this down as the probability of A, given this ancillary event B, intersection C, times the probability of B, intersection C. Aha, but wait a minute. On the right now, I've got the probability of the intersection of two events. And the first line tells me I can write that in terms of conditional probabilities. And at the end, I now have a chain of conditional probabilities. The probability of A given B and C times the probability of B given C times the probability of C. And interestingly, we've can write down the probability of an intersection of three events as a chain of conditional probabilities. This is sometimes called the multiplication rule, but chaining seems to be more appropriate here. You're chaining conditional probabilities together. Of course, the moment you've done three, now there's no reason why we can't do more than three. So suppose we now have n events, a1, a2 through an, and we are interested in the conjunction of all of them, in the intersection of all of them we proceed just as we did for the case of three events. We first group the last n minus one events together, actually, or any n minus one events together. Condition on the occurrence of that composite event. And now we've got a probability of n minus one of them. Oh, but that's easy. Condition again on n minus two of them. And going down the line, we get a chain of conditional probabilities. A1 given the occurrence of A2 through An. A2 given the occurrence of A3 through An, and so on. An minus 1, given the occurrence of An, and then you are left with nothing except the occurrence of An. And there you are. 
you've now got a chain of conditional probabilities which captures the essence of a conjunction probability. Of course, that last equation is a long mouthful, and it's taken you a while to write this down. Okay? We can encapsulate this in a compact mathematical terminology using a product operation. Right? And you can write this whole thing down, meaning exactly what we've written here in this compact form. The probability of an intersection of n events, a1 through an, can be written as a product of conditional probabilities, where the index j runs from 1 through n, and we're interested in the probability of aj given the events aj plus 1 through an. The last conditional probability here is just the probability of an itself. Okay, and so here's a compact way of writing down this chaining formula. But I hope you agree with me that the chaining formula is very mnemonic. It's very easy to remember. You condition on the last group, and you get the first one. Then condition on the next to last group and get the second one. And you keep going down until you've exhausted all the things you want to condition on. Now, this is just mathematical manipulation. Right? And you might wonder, well, is this any use whatsoever? OK, so you've got a formula. It looks a little clumsy. It looks awkward. But is it any use whatsoever? The answer depends upon the problem at hand. In most of the applications we've seen so far, I've given you settings where it is simple to directly deduce what the probability measure is, for example, by writing down atomic probabilities. In instances like that, it is simple to deduce directly from the statement of the problem conjunction probabilities. And once you've got conjunction probabilities, you can then compute conditional probabilities by the usual ratio. But there are settings and there are applications where it will transpire that it is more natural to either define the probability measure implicitly in terms of conditional probabilities, or settings where even when the probability measure is specified directly, it is easier to compute the conditional probabilities first before we compute the conjunction probabilities. I'll give you one example of the latter instance now, and as we go further with succeeding lectures, we will see other examples where conditional probabilities are the natural objects to specify in a problem. So, let's take a look at how such a chaining formula could be used in actually an elementary example. This time, let's draw from cards.